Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the current seminar series hosted by the Department of History and Archaeology, University of Nairobi, and running from September uh, 7, I believe, to December, mid-December. Now, our overarching theme for this series has been bringing down history and archaeology from the ivory tower. The ivory tower is next to us, the literal one, but we also know what that means. Our topic this afternoon is positionality, decolonization, and researching incarceration, a history of the Kenya, Kenyan prison service, 1950 to 19. 82. Now, in my mind, this is an exciting uh, a topic because, as Nelson Mandela would often remind us, a nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but how it treats its lowest ones. And I think you can go no lower than when you're in prison. So an insight into our prison histories also presents us with a bird's eye view on other histories in our country. For the sake of those who do not have our speaker's bio, I'm just going to run through quickly so that we know where he's coming from. Now, Ian Keister Parker is a PhD student at the University of Warwick. He's funded by the UK Economic Social Science Research Council. Ian holds an MSc in African Studies from the University of Oxford, where he was funded by Oxford Research in the scholarship and humanities of Africa. Our speaker this afternoon, this Nairobi afternoon, for those on line of course, it may not be afternoon, also holds a BA in history and politics from Warwick. And he's interested in the social and intellectual history of punishment and penal policy in Africa. Ian has previously worked on British colonial penal policy and the Mau Mau rebellion. And I think that is very exciting for those of us who are interested in Mau Mau studies. In his presentation this afternoon, Ian is going to discuss his research approach through a conceptual discussion and practical example. He's going to outline his, in, his intention to produce an anti-colonial Kenyan history of confinement, and he examines the ethical challenges of being a white Western researcher. Again, I think that should be a point of interest. Uh, what difference does, does it make whether you're a Western researcher or whether you are whatever it is? And I hope we can uh, chip in uh, around that. Um, Ian also considers the advantages and uh, limits of institutional histories, prison, of course, it's institutional history, especially how to balance individual experiences with a history of sy sy systemic structural change. And in this presentation, uh, he's going to illustrate his approach practically by considering the Kenya prison service between 1950 and 1952. Again, of course, those years speak to us because it is when uh, the seed of Mau Mau germinates and turns into insurgent violence uh, 
that becomes a big issue, not just in Kenya, but worldwide. And finally, he's going to argue, hopefully, that the service was poorly organized and reactive, that the prison service was poorly organized and reactive, and also orientated towards the reproduction of the colonial status uh, quo. Well, those are a lot of things, Ian, and we are all looking forward uh, to hearing how you, uh, you it's going to pan out in the presentation you're about to make. Karibu sana, welcome to the podium. Um, Dr. Kenneth Obongi is going to, it's a bit different today. He's going to be our discussant and I will generally just um, uh, hold everything together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction, Margaret. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ian. I'm a PhD student at the University of Warwick. My thesis is entitled A History of the Kenyan Prison Service and Incarceration Between Approximately 1950 and 1983. It's a study that draws on a range of archival and oral sources. And my overall aim is to write a Kenya-centered institutional history, which engages with pertinent contemporary themes while being attentive to alternative possibilities. I'm very grateful for being given the chance to present today. I hope this conversation will generate some interesting discussions. I'm particularly keen, as much as I am to lay out my own ideas, to hear your thoughts, particularly related to my methodological discussion and also trajectories of the Kenyan prison service, if any of you have thoughts on that. Can we change slides? Yeah. <laughs> Can we go to the next slide, please? My paper is in two parts today. In the first half, I'm gonna discuss my methodology, focusing on particularly on how I'm attempting to produce a Kenya-centered critical history from my positionality as a white male researcher at a European university. In the second half, I'm going to give a practical example of my work, illustrating my method in action. This will take the form of analysis of the Kenyan prison service between 1950, the start of my project, and October, 1952, the outbreak of the Mau Mau Rebellion. The two parts are intended to interrelate, but I also hope they'll have some standalone value. So let's start the first half of this paper by defining methodology. Broadly, I understand methodology as the research methods we employ, the sort of data we opt to collect and the ways we analyze and deploy it. Therefore, methodological questions arise at all levels of our work, from broad framing and focus to the way we seek to extract knowledge from specific sources, the way we write. To try and keep the methodology section smooth, my focus is primarily on the decisions I've made. However, I do discuss some thinkers in detail, and I've included a, a range of quotes that have influenced me in the PowerPoint. I'll give you time to read these, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have on those. I want to start by discussing a 2006 lecture by Amima Mama, a British feminist academic, sorry, a British Nigerian feminist academic entitled, Is it Ethical to Stu Study Africa? This lecture has had a substantial effect on my, my approach to methodological questions. I believe the text is publicly available, but if not, I'm more than happy to share it. In her lecture, Mama argues that methodological questions are not just practical questions about how best to collect and analyze data, but also ethical questions about the sort of knowledge we want to produce. She calls for the development of de and deployment of methodologies that hold themselves accountable, and I quote, to the imagination, aspirations, and interests of ordinary people. For MANA, the best way of attaining this goal is to be critical of our methods, asking ourselves a question, and again I quote, what does our research contribute to the various contexts and peoples we study, end quote. MANA reaches this position by arguing there is an inescapable relationship between knowledge and power. When we produce knowledge, we are inevitably making decisions that subtly reshape power relations, both enabling and constraining future actions. At Western universities, like Warwick where I've been trained, 
this idea is often assigned to Foucault, but we might equally think of other thinkers such as Madimbe and Said. A good example of this practically in my work is that past thoughts and actions make it appear very hard to think of alternatives to prisons. However, from another point of view, the development and the diffusion of the penitentiary was a highly contingent historical process, while many contemporary analysts deem the prisons of today as failing institutions. So returning directly to MAMA, while it's possible to think of our methodologies, quote, as universally applicable scientific tools, they're empty of social relations, cultural content and meaning, end quote. In reality, our methodological decisions are inherently ethical decisions because they shape the sort of knowledge we produce and therefore power relations in the world. Now, I'm not stating there's gonna be a huge impact as a PhD student, however, it is still there. Mama herself extends this argument further with a rallying cry to design and employ methodologies that have the goal of producing emancipatory, emancipatory knowledge. Can we go to the next slide, please? The process of ethical knowledge production via method selection may appear simple, just requiring us to pick topics that seem relevant and important to those we study. However, MAMA highlights that things are not this straightforward. This is because our identities, by which I mean our current positions and the historical relationships these embody, inevitably exert a subtle yet deep-rooted influence on the ideas we produce, making it hard to effectively put ourselves in a position to speak ethically and accurately about others. The depth of this problem and how to navigate it, I think is particularly well dealt with by Latin America philosopher, Linda Alcoff. Some of her quotes are on the slide now. So Mama herself outlines a partial solution to the problem. This is, and I quote, to engage critically and reflexively as we proceed to conceptualize our studies. Through this process, we can at least partially challenge our identities in a way that facilitates the production of more ethical and effective knowledge. Mama asserts that questions of ethics are particularly pressing for white Western researchers who are studying Africa. However, understandably, she chooses not to engage with how such academics should produce their studies, instead choosing to focus the, on the question of, and I quote Mama for one mind, final time, methodological issues in an African critical edition premised on an ethic of freedom. Let us summarize this discussion by recapping Mama's argument. She asserts that good research should have an ethical goal affording the cause of freedom, and that this goal should be folded into a study at all levels. However, pursuit of this goal requires critical engagement with our complex web of identities, each of which makes specific claims upon us. So perhaps it will seem odd to some of you that I've opted to open this lecture with detailed discussion of the thought of a social scientist given that history is often seen as a quite different discipline. However, I would argue that good historical research must still engage with the same methodological questions about whom to study and how. Further, I believe that our identities inevitably impinge on the way we interpret our source material. This is not to say that I'm recommending any sort of departure from a goal of truth finding based upon our evidence and the way it points to us, rather it's saying that truth finding is most effectively done when we acknowledge and critically reflect upon our ethical positions during the research process. MAMA's work, therefore, provides a great starting point for engagement with ethical issues in my own study. In the rest of the section, I'm going to discuss some of these specific examples. I'm going to move from um, conceptualization to my writing. An overall emphasis is on how I'm trying to produce an ethical and yet historically effective thesis. Can we change slides, please? Oh, I think we've got too far. No, it's okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> My thesis seeks to produce a Kenya-centered critical history of the Kenyan prison service, or KPS, between 1950 and 1983. By Kenya-centered, I mean focused on the historical experiences of Kenyans and relevant contemporarily to at least some Kenyans. Inevitably, I also want my work to have some sort of positive impact, regardless of how we conceptualize this or how small it might be. To produce such a history presents challenges regardless of the historian writing it. However, my identities or positionality, as it's often referred to, adds another layer of complexity. Specifically, I'm a white male researcher at a European university. Can we just go back to the slide on European parochialism? It's, there we go, perfect, thank you. Why is this identity potentially problematic when attempting to write this history? I think there are three main interlinked reasons. 
Firstly, European and North American thinkers have historically emphasized the importance of a very narrowly defined idea of objectivity. This has acted to delegitimize alternative ways of knowing, which, as a range of scholars are currently illustrating, provide valuable knowledge in themselves and valuable critiques of Western knowledge. Here we might think in a Kenyan example of Ngugi's work on decolonization of the mind. Writing about Kenyan history, given my training and background, inevitably risks reproducing these dynamics of Eurocentric hegemony. Secondly, we live in a world where there are substantial material imbalances in higher education. These enable those at North American and European universities to produce knowledge about other cultures, often in situations where those who are being written about do not have the same access to write back. Thirdly, given my positionality, it is inevitably challenging for me to effectively understand and engage with the Kenyan conceptualizations this study wishes to focus. These two factors mean that there is a real risk that in attempting to narrate the experiences of those I study, I in fact erase or at least warp them. Can we now go to the next slide? Sorry, it's my fault to start with. Um, so this might seem like a challenging starting point for my study, and I think to some extent it is. However, while I don't believe these problems can be transcended, I think engaging with them could allow me to mitigate their impact and at the same time produce an effective history. The first step here, I think, is acknowledgement of the factors outlined above and they're folding into a reflexive approach. By reflexivity, I mean recognition of my identities, how they affect the knowledge I produce and the potential positive and negative impacts they have, regardless of my best efforts at truth finding. I think Anama and Bavina, some of whose quotes are on the screen, mean a similar thing when they talk about positioning. Reflexivity takes the form of explicit acknowledgement in my thesis and here. However, it also has an implicit dimension being embedded on, uh, in an ongoing way into my research as it progresses. Perhaps most significantly, through reflexivity, I aim to acknowledge and highlight that the history I'm going to produce will inevitably be to some extent partial and rooted in my own experiences, in the process shedding any claim over complete objectivity. I think this is an important move, and I also think it opens up space for engagement with a range of other strategies. I'm now going to give some concrete examples of these. The examples I offer are not exhaustive, but I do hope they're representative of the efforts I'm trying to make. Could we have the next slide, please? So the level of conceptualization, I've made two main methodological decisions. Firstly, my topic selection is designed to, to produce a Kenya-centered and critical perspective. This is because I'm specifically addressing an issue that appeared pertinent to Kenyans and where current representations are often problematic and externally dictated. So prior to deciding upon this project, I read a range of articles written by Kenyans and that considered the state of the prison service. These often drew parallels between the colonial past and contemporary realities as part of a call for change. I think the most powerful of these is these articles, a series of three written by Patrick Gathara, you can see behind me, which ultimately attempt to envisage an alternative penal justice system for Kenya. However, I observed that these articles often lack specific historical consideration of decolonization and patterns of Kenyan punishment subsequently. As I read more, I realized this was because there is also a gap in the academic knowledge about this area. This in turn motivated me to attempt to tackle this issue. Thus, from my project's outset, there was a, there was a desire to tackle an issue deemed pertinent by at least some Kenyans. I also wanted to challenge dominant depictions of Kenyan prisons, particularly in the global north. As Catherine Bruce Lockhart, Stacey Hines, and Erin Bratz have recently observed, and I quote, Within the global north, representations of punishment on the African continent have typically emphasized its uniquely horrific nature, with sensational accounts of dungeons, extrajudicial killings, and arbitrary detention. Historical perspectives are needed to challenge such framings. End quote. This is something I've regularly observed, and again, it acts as an important motivating factor. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Secondly, I'm very careful about the framing of my thesis. As I've already said, I'm seeking to write a critical and Kenya-centered history. In this regard, my work draws heavily on the insights of both post-colonial and decolonial theory. However, I'm very careful not to label my history decolonial. 
here I'm informed by the work of Tuck and Yang, who, in an influential article, some of, them, some of the quotes which you can see behind me, entitled, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, highlight the adoption of the idea of decolonizing, when not tied directly to tangible material efforts to this end, acts to weaken the discourse's potency. Going further, they, hi they highlight how easy appropriation of decolonial discourse by Western academics can act to boost their careers while actually introducing harms for those they study. And this is something we can unpack more in questions if people are interested. Therefore, given my positionality, while I want to explicitly acknowledge the influence post-colonial decolonial thought has had on my project, this is a label I deliberately and explicitly avoid assigning to my work. Can we change slide, please? Thank you. So now let's move to the organization and writing of my thesis. How to conceptualize and tackle colonialism and colonial legacies is inevitably a very important question in my work. Here it's crucial to strike a balance between recognizing the force, impact and scope of colonialism without unwittingly centering it as the only issue that matters in the history of this period. Clearly, the impact of colonialism in Kenya was deeper and longer than the simple presence of colonial administrators. However, equally, colonialism has always been contested and negotiated by those who've experienced it, and other dynamics are very important in the post-1963 period. For example, as we shall see, the nature of colonial incarceration was to some extent dictated by the relationships between African wards and inmates, quite separate from the KPS's official goals and the views of European staff. This at times meant that the in quotidian interactions, the penitentiary was not as punitive as imagined. At other times, it led to very violent contexts. Getting the balance right here is something crucial in my history, and I'm not sure I've fully done it yet. However, I am currently taking two concrete steps. Firstly, I want to be attuned to the fact that formal decolonization did not entail decolonization, which is sort of a paradox, but <laughs> that's what I mean. To this end, I will explicitly consider ongoing relations with colonial powers and Western organizations after 1963. So for example, I've already discovered that strong links between Britain and Kenya persisted in terms of penal policy. This was in the form of staff, training, ideas, and also direct tours at some times by British officials as late as 1970. I'm also attempting to be attuned to broader colonial legacies in areas such as language and thought patterns through critical reading of my sources. Although I think in this area, it's harder currently to have any concrete conclusions. Secondly, I'm attempting to be attuned to how those in the prison service understood their position at various points of time, how they negotiated colonial structures and what sort of futures they imagined. Such an approach, I hope, will avoid drawing a simplistic straight line between colonial practices and the present, which in many ways, as many observers have noted, do actually appear colonial. In short, my aim is to try and introduce some complexity where possible into this story. To this end, my thesis draws heavily on Frederick Kufer's emphasis on the need to write history forwards rather than backwards. This approach, as he explains, and I quote, puts process, choice, contingency, and explanation into the fore, avoiding history that is, and I quote again, the story of winners or at least survivors. So how am I attempting to do this? Partially, I'm attempting to do it literally by reading my source material forward as far as possible, although it isn't always as simple as when you come to material collection, you can't choose what you come across in the archive, but I am trying to read my material in that way. A second tactic is I'm placing particular focus on ideas and how they developed, forcing me to engage with imagined alternatives. So a very good example of this is my chapter on the light late 1960s will engage with, with, in detail with what then prisons commissioner Andrew Sakiwa labeled African penology despite the fact that due to chronic underfunding, much of this penology never translated to practice. We can, can we go back one slide, sorry. Um, back. Back. One, one more. No, one more, back like to nine. Oh, well, <laughs> it, 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 it's one in the middle, 10 actually, I'm wrong, sorry. No, okay. <laughs> sorry, that's my fault. So, my thesis structure is also desired to be Kenya-centric. I intend to interview a range of Kenyans with experience of the KPS and its history, both informally and formally. These interviews will be open-ended and guided by my participants. 
an approach I hope will facilitate identification of core worries and concerns. I'm actively trying to engage both the prison service itself, NGOs who work with it, possibly including former prisoners, and academics and journalists who have studied the prison system. So these interviews will provide valuable source material that will be folded into the thesis. They will also be used to shape the broad contours of my PhD. Specifically, I haven't set exact time bounds for my chapters, and I also haven't fully identified my core themes. I hope that these will actually be informed by what comes out of these conversations. So this can be seen based upon the conversations I already have had in the chapter I'll be discussing shortly. Most of those I've spoken to so far have suggested there's been a long-term disconnect within the prison service between discourse and practice. Therefore, this chapter considers both, the, both areas in detail and places them in conversation, an emphasis that is then going to run throughout the thesis. The way I'm approaching writing an institutional history is also designed to enable a Kenya-centric critical approach. I think any in in institutional history inherently runs a risk of being a flat account of institutional change that erases individual experiences. To avoid this and to include individual experiences, I conceptualize the KPS as co-constructed by prisoners, warders, senior staff, and the official discourse that primarily the latter produce. Further, I view the institution as comprised both of formal, formal rules, which we can gain from sources such as circulars and ordinances, as well as informal norms, which require a more critical reading of source material. So I'm not claiming this is novel, but I do believe it helps facilitate the sort of history I'm aiming to produce. It means that in each group, in each chapter, I consider each group, and I also probe their relationship and indeed problematize these core categories themselves. This in turn helps ensure, I'm helps ensure I avoid a marginalization of lived experiences. For instance, prisoners' experiences are crucial to an effective understanding of the KPS, but marginal in the source material. However, a consistent focus on prisoner experience based upon a critical reading allows me to build as, as effective a picture as possible. And this has already revealed some interesting dynamics. For example, petitions written by prisoners in the 1960s allow me to see them as active agents requesting external assistance in areas such as marital affairs, occupations, and as well as their sentences and daily prison routines. Meanwhile, details and disturbances allow me to see how the space of the prison could be redefined by prisoners. But sometimes conflict and contestation led to harsh reprisals. In other contexts, it could lead to amelioration of conditions. Going forward, a more detailed analysis of gender will be crucial. Kenya has consistently had a high proportion of female inmates, as well as a large number of female staff. The other side to my approach to an institutional history is that I consciously seek to place the, key the KPS in Kenya's broader history, avoiding a parochial study. Particular attention will pray to broad trends of punishment and political developments. For example, if we want to understand the fate of the KPS during the 1970s, where we see a trend of mass prisoner releases on several occasions, it is crucial to understand the, the, the fate of Kenya's econo economy during this period, where we see a substantial downturn. So I think no methodological discussion would be work complete without briefly touching upon the migrated archive. The migrated archive is a tranche of highly important files from a range of colonies, including many from Kenya, that were snuck back to Britain during the final days of empire. These files now all reside at the British Empire in Kew. I want to be clear that I believe those files relating to Kenya belong here and should be returned. I'm also aware that it is often extremely hard for Kenyan academics to access this material, a problem I do not have being at a European university. This is obviously problematic given that Kenyan people are those I'm writing about. So I want to acknowledge this explicitly, and I also want to make clear I'm very happy to share any of the FCO 141 files, which is a series name they have at Q for the Migrated Archive, that I've collected as part of this project. I'm also open to requests relating to other source material in the UK, so please contact me if you think I could help. To summarise the first half of this presentation, I'm employing a range of strategies to try and write a critical, Kenya-centred history of the KPS between approximately 1950 and 1982. Central to my methodology is a reflexivity that includes, but also goes beyond, a simple statement of positionality. 
While many of the strategies I've outlined are specific to my work, I hope this analysis has been thought provoking to other scholars, as I believe the methodological problems raised here have resonance more broadly. So in the rest of this presentation, I want to talk about the Kenyan prison service between 1950, the start of my thesis, and October 1952, the outbreak of the Mau Mau Rebellion. This section is in five parts, each of which map onto the way I conceptualize the KPS as an institution. Together, I believe they allow us to build a holistic depiction or to understand the KPS holistically during this period. So firstly, I'm gonna consider the origins of Kenya's prison system, as well as the key ideational forces between 1950 and 1952. Secondly, I'm going to consider penal realities and prisoner experiences. Thirdly, I'm going to look at staffing. Fourthly, I'm gonna consider official discourse and use this as a window to exploring the organization and physical infrastructure of the institution. And fifthly, I'm going to try and tease out some links between dynamics, exploring the social space of the prison. So before moving on, it's important to acknowledge that Dan Branch has already written an excellent article on the Kenyan prison service between 1930 and 1952. I'm very happy to take questions on the ways our works differ, but here I simply want to acknowledge his study's importance and the contribution it has made to my thinking. So to briefly touch on sources, my analysis in this section is primarily based upon annual prison reports for Kenya, reports made by British colonial penal experts who toured Kenya, and material I've collected from the Kenya National Archive during my two research trips. As all these sources are official documents, they have required careful critical reading aimed at both recovering marginalized voices as well as understanding what the documents are trying to tell us and therefore what they can reveal about the Kenyan prison service. Again, I'm happy to talk more about source material during questions if that's something people are interested in. So my overall argument in this section has three strands. Firstly, that between 1950 and 1952, the Kenyan penal system served primarily to reproduce the colonial status quo. Therefore, its key principles were retribution and deterrence, while the system was unusually large, highly racialized, punitive, and orientated towards labor. Secondly, that between 1950 and 1952, the Kenyan prison service was under a substantial pressure on a range of fronts. Thirdly, that the penal system was chaotically organized and thus encompassed significant internal variations, spatially, ideationally, and culturally. Can we just go back to one slide to origins? Thank you. So research is limited, but it seems that patterns of punishment prior to the assertion of British rule were varied. That said, the general emphasis appears to have been on restoration of equilibrium through acts of compensation. So for example, I'm just going to give one example here. Amongst Kikuyu groups, the punishment for seriously wounding a person was the payment of a goat to the victim. In a very limited number of situations, it appears punishments were violent in orientation. However, there is no evidence that in confinement was employed as a sanction anywhere in the modern day territory of Kenya. This didn't stop British colonizers assuming pre-colonial punishments in Kenya were extremely brutal. Indeed, a colonial a prominent colonial penal expert, who we'll hear a lot from, Alexander Patterson, stated that pre-colonial punishments in East Africa, and I quote, allowed murder and mutilation on quite a liberal scale. Due to this perception, the British felt importation of Western penal sanctions would mark a progressive step. By 1911, Kenya had 30 prisons while a prison service had been established. Incarceration rapidly became the primary form of judicial punishment for Africans. However, practically the introduction of prisons was a punitive move. As John Lonsdale and Bruce Bowman have shown, penitentiaries emerged alongside a range of forms of coercion aimed at converting the brute force of colonial conquest into ongoing, routinized, regulated control. This in turn allowed the reshaping of colonial society in pursuit of the colonial state's goals. So what we can see here is that from the outset, there was a tension in incarceration between some progressive ideas and some punitive realities. Let's naturally turn to the balance of ideas between 1950 and 1952. From early on, dominant conceptions emphasized the importance of incarceration being punitive. Crucial here was the presence of a settler population that while small numerically was highly influential. Settlers never gained complete control of the Kenyan state run primarily by officials sent from the metropole. 
However, by 1950, they enjoyed form informal relations with officials and direct political representation on a range of levels, including the influential legislative council. Settlers were constantly anxious about their status, safety, and future in Kenya. These anxieties fed into a cause for a firm approach to law and order, to the extent that David Anderson has labeled the issue, and I quote, a near obsession with a certain section of the European settler community. In this regard, prisons were never settlers' primary focus. However, they did make clear that they felt incarceration was insufficiently harsh. This is perhaps seen most viscerally in a 1940 comment by the Commissioner of Prisons, Heaton, the Commissioner of Prisons, by the way, is the highest rank in the Kenyan prison service, that settler opinion would be little impacted even if hundreds of prisoners were to die of malnutrition. These statements were made in the wake of a similar, an actual event happening in Uganda where hundreds of prisoners did die from malnutrition. These sentiments in turn bled into official conceptions. For example, a prominent 1950 inquiry into corporal punishment revealed that prison officials in Kenya, as Branch puts it, and I quote, had a far greater enthusiasm, end quote, for flogging than their compatriots in the rest of British East Africa. Meanwhile, penal officials regularly referred to the fact that they wished the penal system could be harsher in correspondences to each other. This said, by 1950, a more reform-oriented discourse was also gaining a foothold. In Britain, the dominant penal discourse, and I should stress here that this is a discourse rather than penal practices in Britain, emphasized that punishment ought to be orientated towards the reform of offenders. To achieve reform in prisons, it was felt that meaningful schemes of educational, spiritual, physical, and vocational training had to be developed. This needed to be paired with segregation of different types of offenders. For example, it was considered essential for first offenders to be kept apart from, this is inverted commas, hardened criminals. These ideas were marginal in Kenya prior to the 1930s. However, in the late 1930s, they were increasingly forced upon the colony by the colonial office. Notably, Heaton, who we've already touched upon briefly, was appointed by the colonial office because they saw him very highly as a reformer. Meanwhile, the colonial office established an advisory committee on penal issues in 1937. This was subsequently very active, writing regularly to Kenya, while several members of the committee toured Kenyan penal facilities and offered reports. The pressure clearly was having some impact by 1950. Indeed, Heaton has stated as early as 1940 that Kenyan prisons, and I quote, may and should form valuable centers of moral and educational training, end quote. However, I think it would be a mistake to overstress the influence of this strand of thinking. The primary emphasis appears to have been largely punitive, particularly beyond those officials who are directly accountable to the colonial office. Can we, oh yeah, we're already on it, perfect. So now I want to set this discourse alongside penal realities between 1950 and 1952. The orientation and conditions of Kenyan penitentiaries closely map Florence Burnell's seminal depiction of, clone, of, Afri, of colonial Africa prisons as, and I quote, and you can see this quote on the slide, tools of social disorder, consolidating social divides and colonial rulers political control, end quote. I've outlined the key premises behind me, and I'm now going to use them as a starting point for considering Kenya's penal conditions. So firstly, incarceration cases in Kenya were staggeringly high. As early as 1931, the proportion of Kenyans, Kenyans committed to prison annually was 22 times higher than in the UK. Incarceration rates only trended upwards subsequently, displaying a 40% increase between 1945 and 1950 alone. Meanwhile, at least 40% of committals were for sentences of six months or below. Such committals were often for offences, such as bylaw violations or tax defaulting, that were not considered criminal in nature, even by colonial officials, yet they did lead to carceral penalties. At the same time, 41% of total commissions were on remand, i.e. prior to trial, and about 50% of those on remand were ultimately released without any sort of punishment taken against them. What these trends mean together is that incarceration permeated society relative, relatively deeply, certainly going far beyond any sort of stratum of criminal delinquents if we exceptionalise criminality in that way, which I, I don't think we can, but I think that gives a good example. <clears throat> 
Meanwhile, high penal populations meant overcrowding was endemic. In 1951, Kenya's prisons incarcerated 8,000 people. However, their theoretical maximum capacity was only 5,000. Overcrowding was often to the extent that medical services deemed the situation unsafe. And indeed, on any day between 1950 and 1952, likely 2% of the prison population were officially sick. Overcrowding also meant that prisons were generally unsegregated, despite significant segregation being legislated for in the 1948 Prisons Ordinance. In most prisons, remandees and convicted prisoners, juveniles and adults, and first offenders and recidivists all intermingled on a daily basis. And this was particularly the case at night. There was occasionally some segregation during the day. This was likely highly challenging for new, young, or otherwise vulnerable prisoners. Prison conditions were further harshened by regular recourse to additional punishments. The most common of these was removal or remission, which exposed a prisoner to penal conditions for longer. Stacked punishments involving dietary restrictions, as well as other restrictions, for example, loss of remission or penal labor, for example, was also relatively common, applied in about 30% of cases where punishment was awarded. On top of this, physical punishments were relatively common. In 1950 and 1951, there were around 50 cases of corporal punishment each year. This number nearly doubled in 1952 as the early effects of the Mau Mau Rebellion started to be felt in Kenya's prisons. And meanwhile, and I think this is perhaps the most shocking example, chains as a means of restraint were resorted to with such frequency that in 1950, the colonial office felt compelled to write to Kenya, stating that situation risked, and I quote, embarrassment internationally, end quote. Penal routines, meanwhile, were dominated by work. All prisoners worked, where possible, on occupations linked to the functioning of colonial rule or the colonial economy. At smaller prisons, work was generally on the upkeep of facilities. At larger prisons, substantial numbers worked directly for government departments or in prison industries. Regardless of job, the idea that labour ought to be regimented and physically challenging appears to have been deeply ingrained amongst officials. Consequently, work was primarily orientated towards development of a work ethic, which was measured in output rather than any sort of specific skill. Meanwhile, positive training, whether it be physical, spiritual, vocational or educational, was extremely limited. Attempts at physical and educational training were sporadic and limited generally to major institutions, while spiritual welfare was only attended to if external bodies, predominantly missionaries, offered their services. So the final strand of the prison conditions is that prisons acted to ingrain racial distinctions. Segregation by race uniquely was vigorously enforced with different provisions made for each group. Africans received the lowest level of treatment provided with only uniforms and a mat upon their arrival to prison. For a comparison, Asian prisoners were provided with a table, chair, bed, and mosquito net when they entered prison. The inscription of race was also more insidious. Due to questionable European assumptions that Africans were communally rather than individually orientated, African prisoners were denied individuality. They lived in large communal dorms rather than cells and enjoyed no pri privacy. This denial of individuality was so complete that following a tour of Kenyan prisons, British Prisons Commissioner Sir Lionel Fox stated that, and I quote, on individuality, one must make a nil return. To fully understand the orientation of African interactions with the penal system and the place of the prison in society, it is important to recognize that the prison was only one locus of a broader and incredibly harsh coercive network operating in colonial Kenya. This encompassed practices including, but not limited to, labor coercion, poor living conditions, compulsory communal labor, and widespread extrajudicial and judicial corporal punishment. Coercive practices often overlapped, producing thick, punitive networks that must have made life extremely challenging for many Kenyans. So detailed consideration of this network is beyond my scope here, but it is something very important to acknowledge, as is the fact that warders, as well as staff, would have been embedded in these coercive relationships. Overall, penal conditions meant the experience of incarceration 
was generally punitive and demeaning. Practically, prisons acted to broadcast state power while re-socializing prisoners in line with the demands and imagination of the colonial state and its economy. So similar themes can be seen when we look at staffing, analysis of which also reveals the intense pressure the Kenyan prison service was under between 1950 and 1952. The Kenyan prison service was a highly racialized service. Senior staff, which was internally defined as those doing management roles at headquarters or the heads of major institutions, were labeled, and I quote, superior officers. All of these officers were European, and this distinction was deliberate. In fact, it had persisted even in the face of sustained efforts from the colonial office aimed at facilitating the promotion of Africans to senior positions. And these are started as early as 1936. In 1950, the service was under pressure about its staffing in other ways too. The most senior superior staff had to be appointed in tandem with the colonial office, although more than junior officers could be appointed and trained locally. By 1950, the colonial office was facing increasingly increasing difficulties in persuading good home office prison staff, which was their preference, to undertake colonial service. Meanwhile, many staff in Kenya, as Lionel Fox put it, found the work, and I quote, dead and disappointing and were unlikely to remain. They blame this primarily on the lack of support and an overemphasis on clerical duties. Consequently, as a clone office rather euphemistically officially put it, the quality of senior staffing was, and I quote, uneven. This problem was epitomized by the Kenyan government's decision to appoint John Lewis, a district commissioner with no pre background, as the commissioner of prisons in 1952. This decision had to be forced on a visibly reductant colonial office and was only justified on the assertion that no other qualified candidates were available or indeed were likely to make themselves available in the short term. The rest of the prison staff, of whom the vast majority were African, were labelled subordinate officers. There were 1,130 subordinate officers in 1950, compared to 37 superior officers. The most common of these were warders, who had little chance of promotion. Warders were generally of limited ability, and this was for a variety of reasons. Until 1948, pay had been extremely poor, making it hard to attract recruits. Meanwhile, a pressing shortage of staff between 1947 and 1950 resulted in a substantial reduction in training periods. Training was supposed to be for six months, three months at headquarters and three months in a prison, but sometimes it was cut to as little as two or even one month. And finally, and this is an important point when we go to see the, K the we consider the KPS more holistically, recruitment decisions were entirely devolved to the head of major prisons or in districts where there were no major prisons, district commissioners. These individuals appear to have had no sense of the average or desired standard of officer across the territory. No amount of training would likely have offered sufficient preparation for life as a warder. The warder's day was, as Patterson put it following his trip to East Africa, and I quote, longer and harder than those of the prisoners they supervised. Warders were expected to be constantly vigilant, but had to supervise vast numbers of prisoners. East African prison commissioners, in combination with the colonial office, had agreed that a warder to prison ratio of one to five should be observed. It should be noted that this number itself was significantly higher than the ratio observed in the United Kingdom. However, in Kenya, a ratio of one to, de one to 10 was deemed acceptable, and it was openly acknowledged that levels were often higher still. Meanwhile, water shifts were 12 hours in length and involved carrying a heavy rifle in a poor quality uniform and often hot conditions. Meanwhile, water's conditions, living conditions, sorry, were extremely poor. Temporary houses were common, and any sort of educational or recreational facilities were very limited. Largely, in fact, we only see them in the most major prisons in the colony. Additionally, superior officers resorted to punishment against warders with alarming frequency. In 1951, there were 436 punishments against a warder strength of 1,249. Even if we factor in the idea that, or, or the reality that some orders might have been punished more than one time, likely over 30% of the workforce received a punishment in this year alone. The most frequent form of punishment was fining, 
and this practice was known to cause financial hardship for many warders. Together, these, staff, these factors meant the staff turnover was stubbornly high, with around 10% of the workforce leaving annually, a fact which must have put the service under further pressure. So I now want to move a step outwards, considering the KPS as official discourse, both in of itself and as a window for considering the service's broader organization and its physical infrastructure. Here too, substantial pressure is observable alongside chaotic organization and substantial internal variations. So given my time limit, here as has been the case throughout, my focus is solely on races matters related to prisons. However, it is important to quickly note that between 1950 and 1952, the KPS also ran, approved schools, oversaw a system of detention, organized probation, and also ran an aftercare scheme, although this was limited to the three major prisons. We can see though that the service had a wide range of responsibilities. Given the size of the KPS, this inevitably meant the service was spread thin. It was the smallest government department prior to Mau Mau. It was also generally the last in line for funding in a broader context where there was a crippling paucity of resources. So perhaps inevitably, this led to a generally reactive official approach. Across our periods, the official mind, if you want to think of it as that, of the KPS was primarily focused on maximizing productivity as well as tightening up security. However, this did not stop the institution attempting to develop some positive ambitions. Key between 1950 and 1952 were infrastructure redevelopment and the organization of penal institutions. So by 1950, Kenya's vast prison population had produced a sprawling network of 37 prisons, eight large, 29 small, nine temporary prison camps, and at least 36 local lockups and detention camps. This network was primarily organized geographically with major prisons in, major in, uh, in more urban areas and offenders generally sent to their nearest institution. The KPS was in full control of the eight larger prisons and all prison camps. However, they only provided borders to the 29 smaller prisons. These were under the day-to-day -day control of district commissioners, who were the generalist officials tasked with the broad administration of levels, of, sorry, of areas. Since the Second World War, senior officials have been seeking to reorganize this system into one based around the principle of institutional segregation. In short, they wanted to place different categories of prisoners in different institutions, preventing any engagement with those more criminal and facilitating the introduction of more targeted training. So between 1950 and 1952, we can see some progress in this direction. For example, first offenders were increasingly sent to specialist facilities, such as Katali Prison Farm, while a Raman prison was opened in Nairobi. However, I don't want to overstate this progress. In fact, in 1952, Kenya's three largest prisons at Kasumu, Mombasa, and Nairobi, which were all theoretically orientated towards serious offenders, also held substantial numbers of petty offenders, so those, those serving sentences of six months or less. More fundamentally, perhaps, the KPS had decided it was logistically impossible to introduce any coherent system of record keeping. In the absence of records, it would have been practically impossible anyway often to work out whether or not someone was a first offender or indeed someone who convicted multiple serious offenses in the past. Therefore, where a prisoner sent, was sent in 1952 was primarily a matter of luck combined with geography. Meanwhile, we can see a service caught between two organizing principles introducing some incoherence. Administrative incoherence is observable elsewhere. KPS headquarters de de <laughs> delegated significant authority to individual prison heads, only centrally organizing labor policy. This meant heads of prisons were free to make their own decisions so long as they stayed within the rules of prison ordinance and managed to balance the budget of their institution. This appears to have resulted in some, 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 some significant variation, particularly as a prison's ordinance was often not very prescriptive. So for example, when deciding punishments, as Patterson put it, some chief officers appeared, and I quote, to regard tearing up prison property as being just as serious as trying to tear up a prison warder, end quote. 
a tendency towards divergence was exacerbated by the lack of formal lines of communication. There was no telephone service across the prison service until 1954. And until 1952, there wasn't even a senior conference for you know, a conference for senior officers. The main structure resisting a trend towards variation was a system of oversight and inspection. This occurred primarily through senior officials at headquarters and independent members of the judiciary. However, inspections rarely occurred beyond major prisons and the prison camps. This was despite the fact that it was actually the small prisons who were run by district commissioners who often had no penal experience and also had a multitude of other jobs. This clearly resulted in substantial variations between institutions. So if we compare this quote I'm going to give you here to what we imagine official standards would be like. In 1950, a warder at Thika prison complained that prisoners were, and I quote, allowed to go for a walk in the native reserves as well as to brew and drink beer. The KPS's other major positive goal was to improve its physical infrastructure. Here it was overtly at least having a lot more success in the period. In 1940, Heathland stated, and I quote, that the services buildings fill, fall very short of the minimum standards required for safe custody and good health, end quote, and that this was a chief problem facing Kenya's prison service. A serious building effort began at the end of the Second World War, with 18 small prisons built and several others modified between 1945 and 1951. Plans were also afoot for the rebuilding of all three of Kenya's largest prisons, and Kasumu New Prison was nearing completion towards the end of 1952. Given these efforts, by 1950, the KPS was depicting itself as having made significant progress with more to come. The service did in fact garner some substantial praise for some of its new buildings. One clone office official said that the buildings at Kasumu New Prison were, and I quote, little short of magnificent. However, clone office said Clone Office perspectives also reveal that these efforts were limited. One report by Chin, the Clone Office's social welfare advisor, was particularly scathing. He stated, following a 1951 tour, and I quote, practically all the prisons in Kenya were either now so badly sighted or so inadequate for their purpose that they needed to be rebuilt. The situation has been allowed to grow so bad that a much bigger building program than currently planned must be undertaken. I think we should take Chin's comments as hyperbolic to some extent. Kenya had in fact rebuilt over half its prisons between 1945 and 1952. However, Chin's comments also reflect the fact that building efforts had focused on replacement rather than expansion and had tended to neglect larger institutions. In fact, in 1947, Heaton had drawn up a list of the six prisons that were most in need of replacement. By 1952, only the smallest of these, Kisi, had been replaced. Meanwhile, Nakuru and Nairobi, two much larger institutions that were also on the list, had become so overcrowded in the interim, they had been forced to build additional temporary facilities. All this points to muddled thinking. It also meant the quality of Kenya's penal infrastructure was highly uneven, introducing further variation. We've heard the praises that were given to Kasumu. On the other hand, a colonial office official labeled Nakuru prison and I quote, the worst prison I have ever seen. Various other prisons, including Naivasha, were also singled out for harsh criticism. Overall, this section highlights that the KPS had some reformist ambitions. However, it was under extreme pressure and beset by incoherences. These dynamics would have never, will inevitably have made the implementation of effective reformist measures or indeed a coherent policy challenging. So I want to conclude by considering the social space of the prison. Any conclusions offered for this period are tentative because, as I've illustrated, the prison service itself was highly varied. However, I think we can identify two key themes. Clearly, race was a major force shaping Kenya's penal culture. Africans bore the brunt of the, surface racial, of the, surface, of the service's racialized nature. Indeed, African warders and inmates had much in common certainly more than either of them had in common with the senior staff. Both toiled in hard conditions, shared comparatively similar backgrounds, including experiencing racial discrimination daily, and would not have viewed many inmates as morally guilty. 
Perhaps consequently, Patterson noted that while warders were not overtly friendly with convicts, they were often, and I quote, slow to check a prisoner for slackness, slower still to report him with a view for punishment. This in turn seemed to have contributed to what Dan Branch has labelled a staple attitude amongst most prisoners and an atmosphere of consent, however grudgingly conceded. Such trends, we can assume, were particularly pronounced in smaller prisons where punishment and formal oversight both appear to have been less firm. However, when making any of these statements, it's important not to ignore the looming threat of coercion. At the same time, it appears that European staff felt outnumbered and socially isolated. Senior officers regularly called for the appointment of more Europeans, while the superintendent of Nairobi prison stated it was only the fear of corporal punishment that prevented a substantial number of attacks against prison staff. This feeds into the second dynamic. Prisons were clearly also spaces of contestation and confrontation, while cohesion between staff was limited. Heaton in particular did clearly try and emphasize that the KPS was a united service walking, working towards a common goal. For example, in the 1952 annual report, so a time when the prison service was under the most pressure it had probably ever been under up until that point, he stated in the annual report, and I quote, there has been a fine spirit of cooperation the African staff have worked extremely well. However, these efforts by staff such as Heaton were likely undermined by the high level of punishments handed out to warders and the substantial attrition rate. When we put this with the unlevel, uneven quality of staffing, it was likely impossible to build a stable and positive institutional culture in these years. The existence of resistance by prisoners and staff can be seen in the system's high punishment rate. It can also be seen in acts of defiance from prisoners. Each year between 1950 and 1952, there are over 220 escapes from Kenya's prisons. In addition, major acts of resistance occurred at Nairobi prison in 1950 and 1951. In 1950, several convicts circulated the manifesto to quote from the annual report, demanding the same treatment in matters of diet, dress, messing and sleeping arrangements for convicts of all races and making certain complaints about other conditions in the prison. They subsequently sought to organize a hunger strike, but this was oppressed. However, the prisoners did achieve some concessions, including the introduction of a soap ration. Similar disturbances in 1951 led to a far more harsh clampdown. It seems because this time they were viewed as political rather than neutral questions about political, sorry, about prison conditions. So overall, the social space of Kenyan prisons appears to have been characterized by a mixture of consent and contestation with the exact balance varying between institutions. For example, while it was noted that a humane atmosphere pervaded at Mombasa, there were regular reports of staff violence at Ngong prison quarry, and it appears that one um, prisoner might have been beaten to death there in 1945. So let me wrap up this section and indeed the lecture by recapping my argument and offering some final comments. I've argued that the Kenyan penal system between 1950 and 1952 was orientated towards reproducing the colonial status quo. Meanwhile, the KPS was under substantial pressure and embodied significant variations and contradictions. If we take a second look forward, on the eve of Mau Mau, the service was certainly not prepared for a rapid and substantial expansion in penal population. Um, so I just want to very briefly thank those who have helped me before I wrap this up. Um, the work draws upon a lot of work from my PhD period, so both my planning year and my collecting data list for few people. So I'll fir the first, I of course want to thank my supervisors for their support. I also really want to thank Madeline Foote, who hopefully is here, who really has influenced my thought on the methodology section by providing a lot of interesting readings. And I also want to thank um, Emma Orcherson, Rose Bionga, Baz Renson, and Rob Reed, who have all offered comments or suggestions on e either this presentation or earlier drafts it stemmed from. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to watch. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Ian, for that very wonderful um, uh, presentation that is full of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge, uh, even new knowledge that some of us are not uh, privy to. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Ken Obongi to discuss uh, the presentation and then we can open the floor for questions. All right. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Gachir, for the opportunity. Uh, now, friends, uh, 
you can uh, join with me to upload uh, uh, our friend Ian. Please just give me my, my clap. Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, well done. Um, I've known Ian for quite a while now. And uh, I just want to say that uh, he's done quite tremendous uh, uh, work in his uh, in his study. Uh, Ian um, seems to have embarked on a very interesting uh, study uh, where I want to argue that um, there is a very fundamental continuity uh, when you look at the history of the Kenya prison department between the colonial uh, period and Kenya's uh, post-colony. I like the idea which resonates with uh, Frederick Cooper's uh, notion of transition uh, without fundamental uh, change to independence. In his book, uh, Africa Since 1930, and you also quoted him uh, at some point um, in, 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 in your presentation. Now, um, he, he gave this an approach for today's presentation, which was focused on 1950 and 1952, which is basically the late colonial period and at the height of uh, the Mau Mau uh, uh, movement. And um, he did so by, you know, engaging number one with uh, uh, some of the very complex methodological questions that come with uh, 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 th this kind of um, uh, 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 story that he wants to tell. And then number two, he dealt with uh, the actual material of, of his study. Under the method uh, methodology, uh, Ian uh, seems to be grappling with um, the old questions of and, and issues of methodology in historical scholarship. And I'm calling these uh, old uh, because um, uh, as colleagues, you remember the, the old days of E.H. Carl and, and scientific history, the, the interaction between the, the historian and the facts uh, that he or she is uh, uh, dealing with. Uh, you can also remember the days of uh, Colin Wood in his book, The Idea of History, uh, who reduced history into basically a product of the historian's uh, mind. And of course, I cannot forget um, uh, uh, Henry Butterfield, the Whig's interpretation of, 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 of history, where uh, the historian only engages with the past that has only direct relevance uh, to the uh, to the present, uh, but he takes uh, uh, you know a cue from um, Amina Mama. I don't know whether any one of us has read her. Uh, you know, a Nigerian uh, writer who asks a very fundamental question, uh, which is, and then just paraphrasing, if I understood uh, Ian well, where uh, do we place? the people we study in our historical discourses. Because uh, the people we study are not fixed or fixtures put somewhere constant and not uh, doing anything. But these are people who exhibited interests, needs, threats, and fears. And, and, and Ian takes, um, methodologically it takes the idea of Mama uh, who, uh, pre, uh, who proposes uh, what he called, uh, uh, what she called emancipatory knowledge. That uh, when we write about it, social aggregates, uh, what we need to do is to write in ways uh, that um, emancipates or speaks uh, about the plight and um, the needs of the marginalized. Uh, 
you know, this uh, resonated with what Professor Mohamed Badad, uh, who presented on this podium some time back when he was looking at the uh, history of South African universities, uh, where he disabused the notion of knowledge for the sake of knowledge. So, so, uh, so Ian seems to suggest then that um, as we conceptualize uh, our studies, uh, you know, we need to think of the plight and, and hierarchies of power which define the people we, uh, we study. And, and therefore he says in his case then, he is uh, engaged in writing what he calls Kenyan-centered, uh, Kenya-centric uh, 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 history, uh, which uh, uh, Ian and I find a fairly utilitarian uh, 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 approach of uh, historical study, uh, which resonates with uh, the old uh, British uh, 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 school of thought of the Whigs' interpretation of history, which uh, 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 um, Henry Butterfield provided a critique in, in his book, actually by that title, "The Whigs' Interpretation of uh, of, 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 he, of 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 History." Uh, Ian then proposes. Uh, to uh, do a bit of what he's calling positioning in his approach uh, to write the history of Kenyan prisons. And, and his understanding of positioning is um, removing yourself as a researcher uh, uh, from the center of what you are researching and focusing on the marginal groups of the story uh, that you are telling. That's a very interesting approach, and Ian, I'm looking forward to uh, reading your work finally uh, when it is uh, done. That, that, that's uh, number one. Number two, I, Ian uh, seemed to engage with uh, coloniality in, in, in a bit more uh, different way uh, and, and much away from uh, the contemporary approach in which coloniality is uh, really a basic and critical category into which we fit narratives of liberation. And, and it seems to go in tandem again with Freddie Cooper's uh, thinking that if we take that approach of narrowing our understanding of coloniality as a pipe into which we fit uh, liberation, the more we actually recenter uh, coloniality. V very, uh, very interesting. And in this, uh, he focuses on a number of things, uh, but I will only highlight um, uh, basically three uh, uh, because of time. One, he, he focuses on the uh, uh, the penal practices in, in, in Kenya's prisons in ways that create and engage uh, with what he regards as Kenya-centric uh, uh, story, uh, in which he raises up the issues and the plight of uh, what I see uh, uh, Ian as uh, as uh, probably uh, underdogs uh, within the prison uh, within the prison system. Uh, then number two, uh, it seems to me that he um, examines penal practices within prisons as spaces uh, that were more than just uh, tools of colonial order, as it is depicted in the extant uh, historiography. But he looks at them more as spaces in, in which social aggregates were of course subdued, uh, but manifested hierarchies of power and domination in ways that spoke to conflicts and the contestation all through. And of course, finally, this is the third one. And, and I thought, um, uh, I, I found this very interesting. Uh, Ian seems to show the centrality of contingency, uh, particularly in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in, in uh, uh, the training and the deployment of uh, prison uh, uh, staff. Uh, 
uh, it, it seems to suggest that um, given the way things developed on, 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 on the ground, contingency or circumstances on the ground played a leading role in deciding, uh, particularly at the senior levels, uh, who will be a, a prison officer. So beyond the facade of um, order and the structure uh, in the Kenyan prison system, particularly in the late colonial period, there was no clear cut and stable institutional structure uh, to talk home about, uh, according to, uh, to, to Ian. I, I thought that is a very interesting approach and uh, it, it promises to throw up some ideas that will lead to probably a better understanding of the Kenyan prison uh, system uh, from the colonial period through uh, to uh, Kenya's uh, post-colony. Now, Ian, having said that, uh, and, and if you permit me, I just have two concerns which I want to raise uh, uh, with you, and I hope you have an opportunity probably to help me understand them. One, um, I agree with you uh, in a sense, uh, because you seem to suggest that um, uh, we, we need to refocus our studies and talk about, uh, uh, you know, the marginalized, the, the, the underdogs, uh, some kind of uh, what uh, Indian scholars call support and thinking of, 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 of historical discourse. But then I was wondering, what do we do with that historical knowledge that does not promote uh, this marginality that does not promote those who are marginalized, not marginality in this case, but those uh, who are marginalized. What, what do we do with that uh, kind of historical knowledge? Do we then discard it completely or do we study it separately uh, and uh, create probably uh, some silos uh, where, for example, you'll talk about something that is overly Kenya-centric and something else. And then number two, uh, when you talk about Kenya centered, and I was looking at the period you were focusing on this afternoon, uh, 1950, 1952, that, that very turbulent uh, period of Kenya's uh, history. Uh, who was a Kenyan at that time? In a social setting where you had um, multiple races, uh, multiple ethnicities and, and multiple many other identity. So how do you isolate and say this was uh, a Kenyan and it will enable me now to write uh, a Kenya-centric uh, uh, story? Uh, probably if you find time, uh, please just help me understand that. So uh, Dr. Gachi, I think I will end it there and I give a chance to the rest to raise their issues. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Ken, for your very uh, insightful observation about um, our presentation uh, this afternoon, uh, especially the hierarchies of power on the people we, st we study. I think that's a very important, a very interesting uh, uh, a concept uh, to think about. And in my mind, the question that kept on recurring as Ian was speaking was, was KPS, the Kenya Prison Service, just an extension of institu institutionalized violence against colonized uh, uh, Kenyans. I mean, we are talking from prisons that are dealing with recidivists to political prisoners, whom you may want to call political prisoners during, during the Mau Mau. And therefore you ask, for example, during that period, were, were there any forms of new organizations because, because uh, uh, of that? Did they challenge power, that shift from recidivism, for example, 
to the political prisoners uh, during uh, the Mau Mau. In other words, where do the marginalized fall uh, in your study, right? What role uh, do they play in this? And especially because you're talking about a Kenya-centric uh, uh, you know, approach uh, to the study. Right, now we're going to open up the discussion to uh, the floor, those who are here with us this afternoon, and of course, also uh, our audience online. Uh, we start with George Gona. We take the first question from George Gona. Can we have three or four questions so that our present presenter can Okay, so we have George Gona and um, so one other question, and then we have Ian respond, and then we shall take it from there. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Margaret. Uh, thanks, Ian, for your wonderful presentation. Um, towards the end of your presentation, you talked about um, uh, um, a sort of uh, enhanced building of ins of institutions that is the prison institutions. And you mentioned that the, the, there was a debate between replacement or rebuilding. I think and I want you to revisit that and, and make me understand what what mean, meant what you meant by replacement and um, um and, and and or uh, rebuilding. Um and and what among these two which 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 of this was reformist? Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for those questions. Um, let's well, I'll start with some of the things Kenneth, I think I'll respond and um, then I'll come on to your question, George. I think. So in many ways, I think my study aims to be the opposite of utilitarian, and maybe I didn't quite get that across. And in the opposite of utilitarianism, I understand utilitarianism as quite a functional history approach. And I'm very interested in seeing alternatives and things that could have happened. And in many ways, that's what I hope the history aims to do. It's just about what didn't happen and what could have happened as what did, rather than drawing this straight line between the colonial past and the present. And I think that's one of the ways I try and conceptualize the, the prison service and institution. By keep returning to these parts, I hope we therefore see what might have been different at different points in time. Um, and I suppose that I can understand where this comes from because I also say I want my work to have an ethical impact, which suggests utilitarian. But I think there, uh, a historian's role probably, and, and it ties into your other question, is to find the truth as best as we can from our sources. While in my case, I'll say it's very important to acknowledge also our limits of our point of view. And then we either draw conclusions that might be relevant to the present ourselves, if we feel confident doing so, or we leave it to others to do so. But I would say that showing the contingency and variety of alternatives would be crucial to doing that. So when I say I want it to have a, a positive impact, I would try and avoid defining it in a utilitarian way if that makes sense. Yes. Um, the, the Kenya centric question. Um, this is a very good question and a very important question. Um, so partially I've come to this title because I started thinking it'd be decolonial. Then I thought that's very problematic. So I dropped decolonial. Then I thought I'll use anti-colonial and that's actually in the bio of this talk. And I thought, no, anti-colonial is quite problematic as well because then we're thinking, it looks like I'm directly challenging colonialism in my thesis. And that is something I'm trying to do but it's also not the only thing I'm trying to do. I don't want my thesis to be shaped as just something that's trying to deconstruct colonial legacies in the present and show how bad colonialism was. I want my thesis to show alternatives that could have been possible and alternative dynamics that are very important. So I suppose with that context in mind, I got to this idea that maybe I should label my history Kenya-centric. Um, and I can see the Kenya-centric has problems itself. So you're on, the answer to your question, who would be Kenyan in this period? is I would say, this is a question I would avoid for this part of my thesis, because I'd be wanting to build up, I'd want to show how the colonial state works and what the prison system was like. I'll probably use the categories, most historiography mainly, 
of African, Asian, European. And then after independence, I would think of Kenyans as the people in Kenya generally, unless they self-identify as not Kenyan. Um, so I suppose and the reason I focus on this section is because, as Margaret said, we spoke about it, we see this massive change during Mau Mau in incarceration and the prison services functions completely change. So I wanted to understand what the colonial prison service was like just for a period that was normal before we see how it shifts. And then we can therefore compare that to what comes after. So there are some thoughts on the Kenya centers. And then the third dynamic of that is this idea of, so it's social history. And am I just trying to recover the voices of the marginal? And I think to some extent, yes. So each chapter will focus on prisoners and warders who generally are quite marginal in their system. But I think in some extent, no, because each chapter will also consider the overarching ideas like Sakiwa's penal philosophy will get a lot of focus as well as prisoners. And so if there's not much going on with prison at this time, I will leave that aside. And I think here it's sort of quite important that my thesis, once I pick the themes, I, I stick to them rather than trying to impose a, a value judgment on what I assess more. Um, so I will want to try and sort of avoid making that judgment about who is the marginalized um, beyond saying, rather, I'd like to say, these are the parts of the prison service and we need to understand them all to see what's going on. And this is what happened at various points in time. You can come back to me if you think they're, no. they're, they're bad answers. You. You're very welcome to. Um, so the question, George, um, enhanced building. Um, this is probably just not me not explaining clearly. So I'm sorry about that. So I think the Kenyan prison service realized their buildings were a state of um, disrepair in, in about 1940. And then they sort of have two choices. Do you keep these very bad buildings and build new prisons? because they're already massively overcrowded and therefore, thank you, Sante, and therefore create some more capacity or do you replace the existing buildings in places like Kisi, for example, do we build a new prison because it's really, the existing one's really bad. Um, and Nakuru is a similar example and Nakuru is eventually rebuilt, I think in the mid fifties. Um, and it's a slightly complicated question because what we see during Mau Mau, for example, is Kasumu new prison is due to simply replace Kasumu old prison. And there, the capacity would stay the same. I think Kasumi New Prison is slightly bigger, but they're pretty similar. But when Mau Mau breaks out, they realize they need the capacity of Kasumi New Prison and Kasumi Old Prison. So then we end up with two prisons running at Kasumi during Mau Mau. And you see similar for quite a period, Shimo Latewa opens in Mombasa. Mombasa prison still running as a Imam prison. So my thoughts on this are the prison service are not thinking, we're massively overcrowded. How can we expand to deal with this overcrowding? They're thinking our buildings are very problematic. How can we, within our very limited budget, sort of replace them? So I think maybe there they're not fully thinking through what would actually be most effective for them. But it also has to be bared in mind that there's this detention camp system. Incarceration is on a huge scale in Kenya. So there's not a clear solution, I think, to make incarceration sort of good. And I think, and good's a problematic word, but I've used it there. And so on the second question about what's progressive, and reformist. So I would try and avoid labeling anything progressive or reformist myself. I'm thinking more about what the people at the time would have called reformist or progressive. So I know, for example, Heaton thought that attempts to reorganize the prison system, because so a fact on Heaton for a second, is he actually goes and works with this clone office body who are critiquing the Kenyan prison system. When he leaves Kenya in 1952, he becomes so he becomes one of the main figures in metropolitan colonial penal reform. And so I know quite a lot about Heaton from outside this work. And so I know that he thinks having a, a penal system where prisoners of certain categories don't come into contact with anybody else because they're in separate institutions. So you have remand prisons, first time prisons, repeat offenders prisons. He thinks that would be a very reformist measure. Um, and I think it's not problematic to say it here, given the fact that it was complete chaos and everyone was intermingled in, in Kenyan prisons. Um, I think thinking of the building effort as reformist is more challenging to us if we're interpreting it. But I definitely think, again, at the time, it was being thought of as a good thing, um, both by the people at Colonial Office who were impressed by these buildings and by the Kenyan Prison Service, who I think were proud of some of their new buildings and the fact they're doing it. And they would have understood it as re reform. Um, I hope that answers your questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Yeah. We we'll take another round of questions. Um, yeah, and I, uh, it, it's a term that used a period um, when things were normal, pre-Mau Mau, the Kenya prison service. But Anderson David tells us that, and I quote him, that Kenya's prisons were already notably violent before 1952, more violent than other British colonies. So in my mind, when Mau Mau happens, is the heightened terror and torture that we see just a continuum of what the British had become in Kenya. So we we'll have uh, Chule ask, a, maybe take two questions. Uh, so we have Chule and perhaps one more so that uh, we have our presenter respond to that. Thank you, Margaret, and uh, thank you, Anne, for a um, very illustrative uh, presentation. I, 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 I need to take you back to something that you mentioned about 1911. You said uh, that we had uh, a certain number by 1911, and uh, Kenya did not become a colony until 1920. So I was wondering whose prisons this were, whether they were being run through the colonial office or, or what was happening. The other one, uh, you you started by telling us about your methodology, and you said it was going, you know, uh, ethically, ethical approach, you know, quoting mama and so on and so forth. So I was wondering, once you tell us this this story about the Kenya prisons, uh, then um, then then what what are we supposed to do with this uh, this uh, this new story? The third one. Third one is about the decolonizing aspect of the because you you have presented to us that in your view and I agree with you that the prison service is as colonial as during the colonial period and I was wondering what your views are uh, on just maybe one or two areas uh, or 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 things that can be done to to make an attempt towards decolonizing the service. And I'm not talking about uniforms and things like that. I'm just talking about maybe one or two, three areas where something can be done so that we can be able to say that the prison service is decolonized. Thank you. Thank you. I think Ian, uh, we you addressed the two and then And then we shall go online after this. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I just ask, what was your second question again? Sorry. And no, I can. But the one before that, there was about 30 prisons and then. Yeah. You said around 1910 or 1911, you said we had uh, a certain number of prisons. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering who was running those prisons because we didn't call it until 1920. Yeah. And the, and the middle question? You said it was, was about methodology. Yes, yeah, okay. Yes. But I could also add something else. I mean, since I've been given the mic. Sh sure. I was wondering, uh, uh, as, because from, from your narrative, yeah. you talked about a lot of stuff that is coming from the migrated archives. Yeah. And I was wondering whether you also have had an opportunity to be able to talk to former prisoners or former local wardens and, and how they get into the mix. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start with your question, Margaret, um, about the word normal. So I think you're right, you're right to some extent, I think, as would be my answer. I think you're very right that the Kenyan prison service is unusually punitive compared to other African colonies, and British colonialism often creates very punitive contexts. A lot of studies of other penal systems suggest that reformist tensions are a lot more acute and actually lead to an amelioration of standards much sooner than we see in Kenya, where we do see this very violent penal system at nine uh, com coming into the start of Mau Mau. 
So when I say normal, I suppose I mean more normal for Kenya across the its history since it's emerged as a colony, rather than normal in, in a generic sense, as in like all patterns of punishment in all of the global south, for example. Because there, Kenya, due to the presence of settlers, is very clearly an outlier, I think. I think the question of Mau Mau being just an extension of pre-1952 patterns. In the prison service, the evidence I've suggested is that we see the same trend of harshness during Mau Mau, but the service itself actually changes quite substantially. So, for example, after Operation Anvil, we see members of the KPR, we see members of police, we see people from the education department. We, in short, see a huge number of people who aren't prison officers being sent to work in prisons, and a lot of them stay. We also see people called from Tanganyika, new people called from Europe, former prison officers called. And this leads to an enormous, I think maybe a, a threefold increase in the size of the prison service in the 1950s. And I do think that creates something very different. And I do think Lewis, the commissioner of prisons, is very careful to be very vague about exactly what the prison service are and what they're doing. But they're not just running prisons for convicted prisoners. They're very heavily politicized. And I think prisons are politicized in a way before 1950, but I think this is to a much greater extent during Mau Mau. And I think the proof of this one way or other will be when we consider decolonization, like formal decolonization, 60 to 63, what happens to those people who work in those camps? Do they, are they assimilated back into the prison service or are they sort of laid off? Um, I think in terms of the, if we look at it as an institution's point of view, that's very important to understanding whether or not Mau Mau for the prison service was a sort of aberration or just a continuation of earlier trends. And I don't quite have the answer to answer your thing. So yes, to it was very violent and distinct, but and I'm not quite sure to the broader question. Um, 30 prisons in Kenya in 1911. So this is just, so in fact, it's a directly reference taken from Dan Branch's article. I'm not blaming Dan Branch because what he's saying there is he's assuming the sort of territory that came to be Kenya. So there are places like Mombasa. And so they're run by, um, again, primarily African warders, but um, European staff, mainly, mainly British. Um, I think this is complicated, though, at the same time, because there's not a huge amount of research on this. And this would be a great area to research, the emergence of prisons in Kenya and how they interact with pre-colonial patterns of punishment. They're also neglected. So also, I would have to say my answer is not that strong, because that's not the main focus of my thesis. Um, but what I mean by 30 is 30 prisons in the territory, territory we come to consider Kenya when Kenya's a colony. I am quite clear in the chapter at that point is a protectorate and they're within the protectorate. Um, how to decolonize? I suppose it's a slightly uncomfortable question for me as a historian. For all the talk about an ethical methodology, thinking about, especially before I completed the project, direct ways the Kenyan prison service could be decolonized today seems straying quite a long way away from history, I suppose. That said, I can think of a few things. So I, I think, I think one of the things is a lot of the buildings are built in the colonial period during Mau Mau. And I think uh, a development of new facilities would be a very important thing. And I think you see this in England too, where a lot of the jails are sort of Victorian. And so there's a very strong legacy in like physical continuity. I think another way, would be the way thinking about prisons works, um, but that's often a broader thing in society. Like when you talk to a lot of people, prisons are sort of ignored or in the background. And I think that is something we see in the colonial period. Um, the British settlers encourage that, but we also see that when they try and get prisoners aid societies, so effectively support for prisoners who are discharged, there's very, very low take up in Kenya. And my understanding is that's still the case today. So there's very limited voluntary support Below, beyond the few NGOs for prisoners. And that is very important to rehabilitation. So I think that would be my answer to those questions. Is that, yeah, there, thank you. Um, we just have one more, one more question as Mr. Masika is, um, yes, is going to, I, I can see some hands are already up online. I think we need to give them a chance and then perhaps come back, you know, um, to the to the floor, right? So, Masika, perhaps you want to look at the questions. Okay, just as we do that for us, as we take uh, just two questions from the floor. Thank you. <laughs> 
Uh, hi, Ian. Uh, Ollie here. I was just two kind of short and brief questions I was hoping you might be able to answer. Um, in any of the study you've undertaken so far, have you found any great variation of treatment of people along tribal or ethnic lines specifically? So I understand certain prisons covered specific areas of the country and therefore there would be a natural uh and, and we understand that certain prisons were more violent than others and treated prisoners in a specific way but is there a discernible link towards tribal or ethnic lines and uh the treatment of certain peoples uh and then the other question was quite short which was just uh to what extent was there a loss of identity in former prisoners um, along the lines of sort of, again, tribal, ethnic, gender, culture, class, when they came out of those prisons during that time period? Yeah, we have one more question, then we go on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jan. First and foremost, I want to admit that uh, I really didn't understand the whole script. There's a point at which I napped a bit. But uh, I think your subject is very interesting. I just want to ask one question, uh, which may be or may not be very relevant to your presentation, uh, but uh, it relates to prisons. I know the word service, prison service may have come uh, much later. But uh, when we were growing up, we knew uh, some Kenyan prisons to be really uh, places of terror. And therefore, I wanted to ask, uh, what is really in the, in the name? What is in our name? Because uh, in that region of Gisum we are talking about, there used to be a prison called Kodiaga. And uh, any time uh, you heard that someone is going to be taken to Kodiaga for imprisonment, then you have to lose hope that uh, uh, that person will ever come back. So I don't know what comparative study you have done uh, through these prisons uh, to find out exactly what could have been in the name. Then my other question would be, uh, you know, prisons for a long time and even today, to some of us, uh, are actually closed environments. You don't seem to know really what happens inside there. And uh, I'm wondering how then you will get information as to those uh, terrorizing activities that take place in these prisons, because no one comes out to tell you until and such a, until perhaps such a time when someone is uh, released, that's when you get information that this was a place of <laughs> of terror. How do you to get how do you get information about these places which are closed environments? Uh, thank you very much. So two questions: What's in the name, and how do you get? Uh, that information. Thank you very much. You have uh, Ian respond to those two and then just as we look at um, uh, what we have online. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, on variation of treatment on ethnic or tribal lines in the colonial periods. So this is a the, the, there's an answer, which is that I don't have a specific detailed answers question, but I do have some things I've come across in my work. One is that prisons in some ways actually work to create ethnic categories in the early colonial period, because if you've only got one local prison and everyone's sent there regardless of the offence, and the warders are from that ethnic group as well, it becomes a very ethnically homogenous place. Um, this is, again, isn't a completely original argument by me. Um, it's something Dan Branch notes in um, his article. I do also know that during times of, um, that there were attempts to attract certain groups to be warders in areas that were seen particularly problematic. So um, Ungong River Quarry, which is effectively where the most serious offenders are sent. That's not necessarily serious as in most serious offense, but persistent causing problems in prison. I know there they make an effort to recruit from certain ethnic groups, but I can't remember off the top of my head what they are. So um, I'm sorry, that's a half answer to your question. Um, on loss of identity, so this is a tricky question and it varies over time, I think is the answer. And it varies on what you're sent in for. In Kenya in this 
period until about 1952, most people were sent in, the vast majority were on remission or serving short sentences. And then I don't think really it, there's any change in your identity beyond the fact you feel this brute assertion of the colonial state's power, because it's often, they've often relatively arbitrarily detained you in extremely poor conditions for a short period of time. And so I think you might feel that. Um, identity though might well be more changed for people who are in prison for much longer um, and serving longer sentences. And I think particularly as we get into um, incarceration in the post-colonial period, we start seeing that. But then that's also counteracted by a trend of regular releases. So I think it's complicated. I think the one key thing throughout the prison services history is that there's been a constant emphasis on labor and performing certain tasks. So it's most reformative if, so now I'm using reformative in a normative present sense. It's most reformative. The best the prison service achieved is to teach people skilled labor that they can use upon discharge. So, and that's generally for long-term prisoners at some large institutions. And I think in that case, whether or not we're right to think of it in the sense of class in Kenya, I'm not sure, but they're certainly producing a certain strata of types of laborer. You know, you can't, there's never really been an opportunity in this period to do very serious further study, but there has been an opportunity for long-term prisoners to learn trades and that sort of thing. Um, I think also there might be some interesting stuff to come out and there's been some works for Africa in the context of mines on how gender relations, so particularly masculinity, might be reconstructed by time in prison. And um, someone actually did do a study with prisoners um, in the 1960s, and the papers of that are available. So that would be a good way that I may well come to look at that. Um, what's in the name? So this is a question my, my supervisor, David, has answered much, much better than I probably ever will. And I think David says a, a lot's in the name. This is in his Histories of the Hanged. And it's partially because of this overlap between detention, incarceration, the prison service, and Mau Mau, and colonial practices before, mean for a lot of Kenyans, I think, or at least in the public consciousness, they sort of blur into one experience that is extremely punitive, despite the Kenyan prison service making many efforts to change what the name represents and stands for. Um, notably, in 2002, they adopted the approach of opening up, where now NGOs can come and work with the prison service, whereas before they were completely closed. So they've tried to change what the name means, I think, um, and, and Kenneth next to me was <laughs> giving examples of notorious named prisons when we were going, um, when that question was coming. So I think a lot of it is to do with that recognition of how violent prisons have been, particularly during Mau Mau, but also before. And that name does become very hard to shed. But if we look at it from another point of view, I would say for senior prison officers throughout the KPS history, the name probably means something different. For some of them, it's probably something to be proud of. For others, it's something there's a sort of positive force on society, potentially. For others, it's sort of a relatively neutral term. So I think maybe part of it's our perspective. We're all sort of outside the prison system. So I think maybe we have a different perspective because of those stories we, we hear and the history we know in Kenya is so closely intertwined, as I think David shows, with the various forms of incarceration. Um, getting information about prisons as closed environments. So this is a very good question. I think part of it is you have to carefully and critically read source material because there are sources in the archives about um, and they're generally not full investigations but prisoners having been killed in violence for example by warders we can draw some tentative conclusions from that but there are also studies at various times that have been done during my period of the prison service by people who had permission to go in there for sort of ethnographical studies so that will be a way to look at it there's also sort of just statistics like statistics about punishment can tell us a lot about what's going on but i agree to get the the significant depth into that. It will be very important for me to um, try and use the studies of people who have worked outside prisons um, and, and been in. So for example, this academic Tanner and then another academic Kircher in the 70s, both write their own histories of the Kenyan prison service from a sort of political science point of view. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers those questions. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, uh, We're now going to look at uh, what we have online, Justice, if you can... Um... Uh, sure. Go to the top. Okay. Uh, on the chat, the first message from Eliud Biekon. Uh, I think it's talking about sound system. Uh, hopefully, it's now clear. And then come down to Odongo. 
Uh, and uh, the message is good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ian, for this presentation. It is an interesting topic for sure. I am curious, what informed your interest in studying punishment? All right, how do you get here? Next, uh, there's also, also, do you think that Kenya system was most punitive of British colonies, probably across the British Empire? Uh, quite vast, as you may know. And then uh, Araka, good and thought-provoking presentation, I'm giving you kudos for the good job done. That is it, uh, thank you. Participants with their hands up. Uh, anybody with a question like to... on the online audience? Okay, maybe and uh, you'd like to respond to that as we get along. Um, so the interesting punishment question, I think it comes from, I studied Kenya's Mau Mau Rebellion at university to, originally, having also studied African history more broadly. And it's a very important question in Kenyan history, I think. Um, punishment, especially if you look at it in, a, in broadest terms, is very influential in Kenyan history and at least in academic public consciousness of Kenya. Like um, I've read Richard Reed at Oxford often talks about Maoism, how there's sort of obsession over Maoism amongst Western academics. Um, and I sort of also felt that too. So I suppose one part of me was very interested by Mau Mau and, and punishment in that period. And one part of me wanted to get away from specifically talking just about Mau Mau. So that sort of led me onto this specific topic of the prison service. Um, and that's why actually when I cover the 1950s, I'm only going to cover the Kenyan prison service so far as they're actually involved in um, incarceration or service memories involved. So detention camps, for example, won't be something I consider as a lot of people have written about them already beyond the fact that warders from the prison service were sent there and what was the impact of that on the prison service. Similarly, I'll consider Mau Mau convicts in ordinary prisons um, and, and prisons that are set up during that period, but I'll try and keep a distinction from Mau Mau. So I think, yeah, it's a partial, you're sort of drawn into studying that area and then also you want to sort of get beyond it. Um, so that's a punishment question. Most punitive, I... Is it just British? I can't remember if it's just British colonies or not. British colonies, okay. So, I mean, it's not an answer I can give for the whole empire. I don't think I know enough about that. But I can definitely say Kenya's right at the most punitive end of the spectrum. And within colonial Africa, if we consider British colonies in our period, Kenya is comfortably the most punitive if we look at all coercive practices, um, not just imprisonment. We might also think of South Africa, but obviously not a British colony at this time. But we see similarly harsh punitive practices. Um, and then obviously the French comparison in, in French Africa would be Algeria, though there are difficulties making that comparison, but that's where it could be drawn. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. I don't know if uh, we have any more questions. So we have one more from Dr. Gona and uh, Mr. Masika himself has one question and if there are no more questions online then maybe we can wrap up our presentation this afternoon thanks ian this is just a suggestion um you talked about uh the punishment on waters when 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 they didn't behave as uh, as workers of the colonial government uh as you go towards um, independence, I think it is it's good to consider how that affected um, Kenya's perception of um, being a warder and, and whether one would be ready to actually join the uh, prison service. Just a suggestion. Uh, thank you very much, Ian, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, mine is just a follow-up on his question on identity, which, which uh, I believe it cannot run away from the prison, uh, because I, I'm picking it from uh, Koetelela Rapsamoe's son, uh, who was arrested when he took over the resistance from his father, who was uh, killed. Uh, you'll see that the British will move him to, is it 
Neri and then move him all over so that by all through the British rule, he remained in prison. And how did that affect his identity and particularly the people that uh, the, the clan that he represented, which are still right now making noise that they never went back to their ancestral land. Um, maybe you will want to revisit that question of identity. And again, uh, look at uh, the Mau Mau in detention. The British had a, uh, uh, a practice of sending people away from their homes in uh, in Kismayu, they will send them to various prisons. How did that affect them when they were released? Because we've seen, even after independence, Mau Mau fighters remained in prison. And when they came out, the farms they were fighting for, some of them had been taken. So they didn't even have a home where they will go back. Maybe the, the African settlers had taken the land and their families had been relocated to other areas and up to now, they are still uh, hanging around, not knowing where to go. Maybe you'll want to revisit uh, that question of identity. Thank you. It's more of a suggestion. Oh. <laughs> respond if you oh, perhaps Ian would like you'd like to comment on that or maybe not it's really up to you it was a suggestion I can um so I think the punishment against warders point George is a very good one and it's one that I will try and track over time it's a bit hard to find out what attracts people to the prison service from the records that are available it's much easier to track them once they're in there so if they if they leave and also the level of punishments so that's definitely something I intend to do. And I do think it's important for understanding perceptions. And we do occasionally get outside glances, but because I'm trying to focus on the institution sort of in a broader punitive context that evolves over time, it's probably not an area I'll go in, in too much detail to, although I, it is definitely something I want to see um, how, how, because I do know, for example, so to just, just give one example, I know that in the 60s, the late 60s and the early 70s, there is almost a surplus of people who want to be warders. It's quite a popular um, thing. And you can find in files loads of people writing saying, I've passed various certificates at school. I'm a good footballer. Can, you, can I come and join the prison service? So there obviously is active interest in joining the prisons in that period. Um, I also know punishments are quite high at that time against staff. But in that post colonial period, you see a complicated dynamic because the prison service starts to recruit for example, very good runners. They have like the annual reports are often about like they've won a gold medal in the Olympics with a, a prison officer. So I think they're sort of full and then they're, who they're recruiting changes slightly. Um, and that would be a very interesting dynamic to change, to trace how that affects other warders' perceptions of them. Um, there's a devastating annual report when they lose, they, they're relegated from Kenya's football Premier League. I can't remember in what year, but the commissioner of prisons is really, really upset about this and says they'll be back next year. I don't think they ever were, but um, it, it was obviously a big thing. Um, and the identity thing, I, I don't really feel qualified to comment on that apart from in the context of Mau Mau. And I think in the context of Mau Mau, you're, you're right, but it's beyond the scope of my thesis would be the answer. So I think it definitely, incarceration definitely did shape people's identities when they came back after being detained. You might have experienced very severe torture a long way from your home, um, extreme coercion for a large number of years, and then you've lost your land, like that is inevitably going to substantially shape your identity. I think that's Dan Branch's first book covers that topic very well. Um, I, I think I need to try and keep the thesis quite tight, chapter-wise, to the service and people's experiences in it. Perhaps there I can offer some conclusions on that in the conclusion, but I think it would sort of take me down a rabbit hole if I could engage with that more broadly. So yeah, thank you for those comments. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, just as do we have anything more on online or can we wrap up? No. Thank you very much, Chair. Ken, do you have uh, 
Thank you very much. I think we all agree that, uh, Ian, that was a brilliant presentation, especially in regards to methodology. I, I think it was superb the way you centered methodology in the research uh, that you are carrying out. And the question of positionality, of course, very, very important identities and how we engage with, with knowledge, how we engage with the world. I think, um, again, that was uh, a very interesting tra trajectory that um, you have presented um, in your uh, presentation uh, today. Just one last comment, uh, not, not for your response, uh, but someone has said, I think it has a certain person, Patrick Gadara, he says that Kenyan prisons today carry the DNA of their forebearers. And, and that, that doesn't say much for us uh, in the post-colonial uh, state, because he's talking about the colonial prisons, the Mau Mau detention camps, and he's looking and said, you know, look, here we are 60 years later, 70 years later, and our prisons still carry that uh, uh, DNA. So I think it behoves us scholars, uh, uh, you know, to augment uh, the work that scholars like Ian is carrying out uh, to see what's going on with us in the post-colonial state concerning uh, the prison service. So without further ado, I think would like to thank uh, our presenter this afternoon, Ian, would like to uh, thank those of you who are here with us present and all those who are with us online for the questions, for the contributions and the comments that have been made this afternoon. Thank you very much. Our series continue. And uh, is it next week, Ken, or the week after? Yeah, so Aluta Continua, we are, we are going to continue with the series uh, after next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. And good afternoon from Nairobi. <laughs>